This is going to be a mining stock education lecture about being very careful about chasing the top performing mining stocks. But first I have to do the stupid disclaimer. So anything I say on this lecture or podcast, any listener questions that are answered are my opinion only. They are for informational and educational purposes only. Do your own additional due diligence or research or contact your uh, your financial advisor before making key investment decisions. I do not want to hear later that you bought shares, uh, you put most of your life savings or all of your life savings into one to four junior mining stocks because they were going up. You put hundreds of thousands of dollars into there because you're expecting to be able to retire on a beach in Latin America and bang Colombian or Peruvian hookers for the rest of your life and then blaming it on me, okay? If you're in your late 30s or early 40s and you're doing things like that, you need to really look in the mirror and not blame it on other people. So back to the lecture. We're going to start the lecture now. So this chart, you're not going to see the whole chart. It's way too big for me to put on here. The chart is from Ronald Stuffelay of Incrementum AG. It is an excellent chart. You can take a look at the full chart on his Twitter or it's in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group, the full chart. And the reason I'm doing this lecture, I was thinking about it actually before, but I got confirmation of this from some people who have been hitting me up, podcast listeners, people in my Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group and elsewhere, asking, Jason, why are some of the more quality royalty and streaming companies underperforming lately relative to other mining companies and why are some of the jason why are some of the more quality mining companies underperforming relative to some of these other mining companies and juniors so i I, i'm gonna explain why so first off this thank you very much for the super chat i appreciate it so uh, i'll answer super chat questions later let me get this stuff done first so first off um I think this chart, there are members of the gold community, not everyone, but some already from what I'm hearing. There are some that are using this as recency bias to their advantage and also cherry picking data. And they don't want to talk about their long term track record. They only want to talk about how since June, some of these mining stocks that some of these people in the gold community have been owning, which many of these mining stocks, if people in the gold community recommended some of these guys, some of these ones were down way more than 60%. Some of them have had enormous rallies since June of this year. So you have on the chart, since you guys can't fully see it, you have El Dorado Gold is up 130% since June. Detour Gold is up 88% since June. New Gold is up 83% since June. Coeur d'Alene Mining is up 81% since June. Taranga Mining is up 73% since June. Continental Resources, uh, or Continental Gold, I think, because there's also a, a oil company, Continental Resources. Con- Continental Gold is up 70% since June. First Majestic Silver is up 68% since June. Remember, I was talking, um, I think, in early 2019 or May of 2019 when First Majestic Silver was at 5 or $6 per share. That, In my opinion, I thought it was cheap. Uh, Silver Crest is up 67% since June. Yamana Gold is up 65% since June. Uh, I could read more and more and more. There's a bunch of them, but at the bottom of the list is some of the higher quality companies. So your Fresneo is, uh, excuse me, um, let's let's talk, where's Franco Nevada? Franco Nevada is only up 20% since June. Uh, Weed and Precious Metals is only up 20% since June. Osisco Gold Royalty is only up 16% since June. Sandstorm is only up, I think, 15% since June. Hecla, which was predictable, in my opinion, is only up 10% since June, given all the problems that Hecla has with trying to fix problems with operations, all the CapEx, and then also the problems with their balance sheet with debt. So that was predictable that Hecla would lag. Okay, the GX... GDXJ index is up 35% since June. So to only look at things since June is a little misleading, let's say. I think it's recency bias. I think it's cherry picking data, especially when there's a lot of members of the gold community that have been recommending people keep buying the dips in all these gold mining stocks. There's even some newsletter writers out there that recommended gold mining companies that dropped 90% or more or went bankrupt. There's a money management company that recommended a lot of mining stocks that went down 60% or more and some of them went bankrupt. And you know they've been recommending since 2011 to keep buying the dips and have a large share of that in your portfolio. So to say that 
people have done very, very well since June. Well, how many people actually started buying mining stocks since June? Okay, most of the people listening to this podcast have had at least some exposure to mine stocks for a lot longer than since June. So that's why I'm saying that there's recency bias and there's cherry picking of data that if you were holding some of these mining shares from 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, or 2016, you're not up the 130%. So your cost basis is going to be different than the numbers on that chart. So you would have had to have perfect market timing then to have gone, let's say this is hypothetical, to have gone into a quality company like Franco Nevada if you would have bought and hold Franco Nevada in 2013 when it was $40 per share. The company still grew revenue, still grew earnings despite the gold price not doing anything for years or going lower and the business was still well run. They still still increased their dividend. And so the share price for Franco Nevada from 2013 to now it went from 40 something in the mid 40s up to let me look at it right now we are at $92.78 so yes the last month and a half two months franco nevada has underperformed however if you go back since 2013 you slept better at night being a shareholder of franco nevada so yes you have underperformed recently and this trend of people that are switching from the safer gold mining stocks to more of the risk on riskier stuff this is something that i would say that eric sprott did a lot of so in starting in june i believe eric sprott sold about a hundred million dollars worth of his kirkland lake gold shares i think it was at most a 10 percent stake he sold and then he started reallocating a lot of that capital the profits after he paid taxes on it or save some for taxes. And then he took a good amount of that capital and he's been reallocating it into a lot of different, all, all the silver companies, all the primary silver miners he could find, some of the juniors, some juniors, and then also some higher cost miners expecting higher prices. So he's gone from being more cautious and focusing only on quality companies to more of a shotgun approach and risk on and being more aggressive with his capital allocation. So the average person doesn't have the capital that, that Eric Sprott has. So for them to start spreading it around and taking on as much risk is a lot more dangerous. If Eric Sprott loses $100 million, it's not going to hurt Eric Sprott as much. So what is happening, if I could summarize then what has been happening and why these other gold miners have been performing more, is there's a lot of professional money managers that have been seeing doing the similar strategy to Eric Sprott or straight up copying Eric Sprott. And they've been going from the more high quality gold companies, say Franco Nevada's, Kirkland Lake Golds, Sandstorm Golds, and they've been allocating more capital into the riskier gold companies and to juniors. These are the companies that are more marginal producers that have higher costs that might have more debt and or might have more debt on their balance sheets. By the way, guys, I'm doing all this without notes. This is all from memory. This is 10 years of experience in the mining industry, interviewing most of the top experts in the industry, CEOs, speaking with people off the record, uh, mining company CEOs. And also I one of my day job things was also covering mining companies for a while. So I do have a lot of experience in this industry. I've interviewed most of the experts. On top of this, Nolan Watson, who I'm friends with and interviewed many, many times, every three or four months now for many years, he has his pulse on the financing of pretty much all the gold mining companies. So he's he has an insane amount of deals come across his desk, whether it's for helping finance a producing miner or juniors, and he turns most of them down. So he's he's literally right at the pulse of the entire of the financing of the entire industry and the financing of the industry has changed a lot due to the gold mining ETFs. The gold mining ETFs have hurt the financing ability of a lot of juniors. So this brings me back to the warning now. So there's people in the gold community now that are going to be telling you how much of a genius they are for picking out the right gold mining stocks since June. Well, were they heavily invested in gold miners for the last seven years during the bear market from 2011 when gold was falling down to 20, you know, 2018 and part of 2019? So a lot of people in the gold industry will conveniently leave that out. And I've made mistakes too on gold mining companies and I've admitted my mistakes, but there's many, many people in the gold community. There's a lot of paid newsletter writers. 
Um, unfortunately, one of the companies I worked for in the paid newsletter writer industry, we had a lot of losing stocks, including one uh, some gold mining stocks that lost a lot of money and they were removed from the total returns. So even though the gold miners went down 30 or 40% in a short amount of time, they were removed. There's a lot of unethical behavior in the newsletter writing industry from the big ones, big newsletter writer companies and the small ones. It is caveat emptor. It is buyer beware. And it, you know, if you speak, if you're an employee at one of those places and you speak out, your job's at risk. They tell you either you ship up in line or you're getting fired. You're you're being replaced the next day. It is the you got to be very careful about which newsletter writer to trust. There is good newsletter writers that make mistakes. There are good newsletter writers that are very unethical. There are people that are very excuse me. There are very smart newsletter writers that are very unethical. There are good, good newsletter writers that do a lot of research and still make mistakes, and hopefully they will own up to it. Hopefully they will admit they're wrong. Hopefully they will learn from the mistakes and try to get better. But unfortunately, with a lot of adults nowadays, especially in the gold community, this is not true. And so even though this chart is showing how well some of these gold miners have done since June, if you go back and look at the charts, for the last like six years, a lot of these gold mining stocks are still down more than 60%. That's the point I'm making. So for people to say that they're doing well, if you would have had perfect timing and you would have went from, this is hypothetically, if you would have went from, first of all, Sandstorm Gold started rising before gold took off in June. Sandstorm Gold, let's just use Sandstorm Gold since I'm very familiar with the company. Sandstorm Gold started to really rise in November, December of last year. It bottomed, the shares bottomed in the mid threes and then the shares have taken off. So if you were more, if you bought in back then when the shares were very, very cheap, you've done very, very well. You benefited when the company had assets coming online, generating more cash flow before the gold prices even went up. So it's all, this is why I'm saying it's recency bias and cherry picking of data. Because you basically would have had perfect, you would have needed perfect timing to have gone from Sandstorm Gold or Franco Nevada or Kirkland Lake Gold or West Dome Mining because for many, many years, guys, out of all the gold mining stocks and all the silver mining stocks, there was really only about a handful of gold mining stocks the last seven or eight years until the last couple months that did well, despite the gold price. Kirkland Lake Gold went from $2 per share up to $40 per share, went up 20-fold. Franco Nevada did very well. Royal Gold crashed at one point a few years ago, and then it doubled. It went from like $50 or $60 per share up to $120. So it's all it's all about timing. This this graph here, yes, it looks nice that these gold stocks are up, but most people did not have perfect timing on these gold shares. Okay, and now we're up to the warning about being very careful about chasing the top performing mining stocks higher, and this all has to do with how the industry is a poor steward of shareholder capital and a poor steward of allocating capital and running an efficient business. So a lot of these companies that are high up, that are over 40% gains, I can guarantee you because I've heard, I've interviewed management, team, I, management teams, I've spoken off the record, I've interviewed mining company CEOs of all different sizes, I've spoken to them off the record, I've, inter, uh, I've spoken to inter, investor relations people a lot in lengthy emails, and I can guarantee you if they have not already done so, and according to Nolan Watson, he says that now a lot of these mining companies, the producing mid-tiers and the seniors, there is now the ability, and we're at gold prices now at gold is still at over 1500 at 1509 and silver is at $17.07 in US dollars when we're doing this live stream on Sunday night, August 18th, 2019. We are at a gold price, unless the gold price were to go considerably lower, we are at a gold and silver price, especially gold, where a lot of these primary gold miners, whether they're higher cost gold miners and or have bad balance sheets, where they are debating raising one, if they are a mid-tier or a senior miner, $100 million or more in the next six months or less. And let me explain what can happen to you if you're a trader or an investor and you bought, you chased some of these higher, these fast flying gold mine stocks higher and you're caught off guard. So let's say that you bought into El Dorado or Coeur d'Alene or some of these other mining stocks that are up 80% or more already, right? And 
some of these miners, not all of them, but some of these miners have bad balance sheets, which means they have too much debt on the balance sheet. They don't have enough cash. Their costs have not been cut. But now that the metals prices are higher, they're a marginal producer, a higher cost producer. And the difference is with a company like Franco Nevada or Sandstorm, they have low costs. So when the metals prices rise, they their margins are maintained and expanded. But a lot of aggressive investors and traders, they'll want to buy the more marginal producer because the marginal producer will go with a higher metal with a higher metals price. The marginal producer will go from either losing money or barely breaking even to a profit. And that's where in a short amount of time you can make a lot of gains in the stock. However, you can also be caught off guard with these companies because literally tomorrow or the next day out of nowhere if you're not aware of how the industry operates all of a sudden a hundred million dollar or more share dilution equity financing deal like a bought deal or term sheet offer or shelf offering one of those things a shelf offering which was already been filed all of a sudden 200 100 million 150 million 200 million dollars was raised and if you're not if you're not checking your mining stocks every day and you're not aware of what can happen with some of these marginal companies with either higher costs or and or bad balance sheets not enough cash on the balance sheet because the mining industry in general there are exceptions to this rule but the mining industry in general is not efficient with using capital and a lot of the CEOs of these gold mining companies really do do not do a good job for their shareholders they don't care as long as they get their option uh, stock options and maintain their high salaries, they will routinely serially dilute. And we're not at the stage where a lot of the miners, um, except for maybe Hecla, where a lot of the miners, just my opinion, Hecla, where um, a lot of miners have to do reverse stock splits. But we're at a stage now where a lot of the miners are going to be raising massive amounts of capital. So you could be up a lot on a mining share, and then all of a sudden, here comes 10% total 10% dilution or 20% dilution or God forbid more of a stock from a producing miner dilution in a deal and in the shares crash. And if you're not familiar with how some of these financings go and normally it's for, and they're not gonna give you these mining companies guys, they're not going to give you warning. So the mining company CEO is not gonna issue a press release to you guys warning you saying, you know, in the next couple months, I think we need to raise 100 million or 200 million dollars in capital but i can tell you for a fact that a lot of these producing miners and especially juniors who don't have any cash flow coming in any earnings or profits or cash flow or they have very very little not enough to cover overhead expenses or drilling budget they are discussing many many hours per day how to raise capital okay this is especially true of juniors but it's also true of producing miners who are more marginal and have bad balance sheets or not enough cash. So if you're a trader and you have, this is not financial advice, if you're a trader and you have individual mining share positions, the smart thing to do might be to have like stop loss limit orders or trading trailing stops, things like that, that protect your gains. You can put these things in, you can change them and move them up. So if a mining stock goes higher, you can move your trailing stop up or your trailing stop loss limit order, things like that. You can move those things up and that will protect you from a dilution, at least somewhat. It could somewhat protect you. You might be able to get some of your position out, but there will be a lot of these miners that do that. Now, there is another particular fundraising issue that happens for juniors that a lot of people are not familiar with, but if you speak to a lot of people um, a lot of mining CEOs who are going to be more honest or newsletter writers who are going to be more honest or mining analysts who are going to be more honest or people like Nolan Watson who talk about this all the time when he's at a mining conference, they will tell you. So a lot of these juniors and one of my listeners on Twitter told me about this is the junior, this junior miner out of nowhere, it just did another financing last week and the financing was heavily dilutive. It was one new dilution share and one new warrant and so the person was really really upset at the dilution and on top of this normally what happens is if a hedge fund participates in these equity raises where they're getting in um they're putting capital to work normally like a few million dollars or 10 million or 20 million something like that if a hedge fund's putting up millions of dollars and they're they have to hold the share uh the shares for a certain amount of time and then they're getting their one warrant per share, which is very dilutionary. 
and the management teams are going to, there are going, not every management team of a junior is going to do this, but there will be many. And hopefully they won't waste the capital. Hopefully a lot of the capital that is raised will not be wasted on um, expensive conferences, going to five, staying in five star hotels, expensive dinners, uh, flying first class, flying on private jets, um, paying for advertising on YouTube videos. Now, uh, there are some int decent mining companies that will advertise, but in general, a lot of these companies that are paying for massive amounts of advertising on YouTube videos and paying for all these podcasts, it's a big red flag to me. If it's a junior, I want to see the money, most of the budget going into drilling or advancing a project towards cash flow. But what the hedge fund will do, guys, after they get the shares, they will short so once, not only will the share price fall from dilution, but then you have added pressure of the hedge fund manager who just did the equity raise. He is now shorting the shares to because he wants to dump the share, the lockup shares, his equity shares, as soon as they expire from lockup and only keep the warrants. Okay? So you're not going to hear that in a lot of other places, but it is commonly, routinely discussed off the record commonly routinely discussed off the record among executives at juniors among paid newsletter writers you rarely see people write about these equity financings for the juniors and how once the hedge funds or or some uh very high net worth sec accredited investors want to hedge their positions and they they want to start shorting the junior mining shares prior to the lockup I'm not even sure how many articles there are about this. I can't remember if I've seen an article about that recently. Tarquinius asks on Super Chat, he put all his minor portfolios in ETFs. Is that bad? Hey, Tarquinius, this is just my opinion, not financial advice, but if you don't want to do a lot of research and you, you just want exposure to gold miners and silver miners, it is the smarter and safer idea. So if you don't if you don't know which paid newsletter writer to trust or you don't want to take the risk of buying an individual mining stock, that is probably a smart idea to just stick with the gold mining ETFs. You'll get a basket of these things. You will get exposure. Um, if there's a couple mining companies inside the exchange traded fund, the ETF, that are doing capital raises and their shares crash, you're not going to, the whole index might not crash. And this is the danger of picking out the wrong individual mining stock and not being prepared. And also what I would say, and people are asking me, why is Sandstorm down? Why is Sandstorm down like 10% correction? Well, first of all, I think money is rotating out of Sandstorm that is taking gains in Sandstorm and it's going into these riskier shares. But I can tell you that as long as metals prices stay at these levels or rise, there will be a lot of share dilution coming. A lot and that will not be the end of it if you're familiar with the mining industry these guys a lot of these companies not every company but a lot of them are serial share diluters and this goes back to my other mining stock education lectures okay the mining industry has to deal with the capex issues there's always whether it's a producing mine or you're building a new mine and the odds of a building a new mine of it coming on time and on budget, the odds are low. Once in a while, you will get an exception to the rule. Once in a while, you will get a brand new gold mine. Like it looks like so far that the uh, Lundin Gold, their mine, Fruta del Norte in Ecuador, that is coming in on time and on budget so far. That mine, I think, is 78% done with construction. It so far looks so good, but you never know. And it looks like that Equinox Gold, them restarting and upgrading the Arizona mine, that looked that there was only, I think, about a month or two delay. It wasn't too much. I think the mine was supposed to start in February or March, and it started in July. So there was only a couple months delay. It wasn't too bad. There wasn't, um, you know, an extra $100 million they had to raise. It wasn't too bad. Ross Beatty and his CEO, I think, did a pretty solid job there.
So if you see, if you own an individual mining stock and it's roaring higher, it's at 50%. This is not financial advice, just my opinion, but I can guarantee you if the management team running that mining company knows that their balance sheet is not good, that they have too much debt, that they don't have enough cash, that they have a CapEx bomb coming up that you're not aware of, a surprise, enormous amount of CapEx for a producing mine or a mine they're bringing online. There's going to be, the mine is not on time and on budget. There's going to be a cost overrun. They're going to drop, with the stock going up, they're going to drop a big press release announcing an enormous dilution, 10% dilution, maybe even 20%, maybe even more than 20%. Um, you learn from looking through the management discussion and analysis of the mining companies and seeing if it matches the results. So you go and look at the investors' presentations of the mining companies, you listen to the conference calls, you look at the financial statements, you read the annual reports, um, you look at the technical reports on some of the stuff for the individual mines, and you see if it matches. So if the mining company is giving you guidance, telling you that it's going to cost say $300 million, this is hypothetical, $300 million to restart this gold mine or restart this silver mine. And the mine is going to be producing, say, 12 months from now, right? And then all of a sudden, it takes $800 million to, uh, worth of capital to bring the mine back online. And then instead of 12 months from now, it takes three years, the miner might be in trouble. Okay, so it's about looking up what the management team is saying and then checking and making sure that they're doing what they're saying or that they didn't change things. Um, I've talked about this at length, that the all-in sustaining cost metrics, the all-in sustaining cost metrics are lies, a lot of them. They're underestimating. War Daddy asks, is there a lot of investor fraud in juniors? Yes, there is an enormous amount of fraud. But if the gold price is going up and the silver price is going up, as Doug Casey likes to say, when the wind is strong enough, even turkeys will fly. So if the gold price in US dollars and the gold price in pretty much every other currency except for dollars has been in an enormous bull market, and the gold price in every other currency but U.S. dollars is either at or near an all-time high. I think it's a little off the all-time high in the euro, in the gold price. So the, the gold price in U.S. dollars is the only gold price that is not at or near an all-time high, at least in nominal value. So there are a lot of dangers. There is... I talked about it. I did a lecture on this about how to analyze risk versus reward. There is a lot of upside, a lot of reward for buying an individual mining stock or a junior. But the average retail investor does not understand any of the risks at all. I've had long conversations with very smart people and also not so smart people who just happen to have a lot of money and have gambled or, or lost it because they don't want to. They don't want to um, pay for the right paid newsletter writer. They don't want to buy a mining stock ETF. They don't want to put any of their capital at like someone like Sprott, uh, Rick Rules, American Sprott. I forgot what his uh, parent company is called, Rick Rules Company. It's one of the Sprott group where they have geologists on staff. They look at things like that. Davey says exploration mining companies are money pits. Yes, I would agree. Most of them are more than 50%. But if the gold price is going up, guys, those shares will go up, and then the fraudsters in Vancouver will come right back out. Because the fraudsters in Vancouver, I, I don't know how well marijuana has been doing lately. The marijuana stocks, I haven't been paying attention. But now that gold is in a bull market in every currency at or near all-time highs in every currency but the dollar, and it's starting to rise in dollars, Vancouver will start to promote the gold juniors again. At what commodity, this is an interesting question from Troy George, at what commodity prices does Hecla become savable, profitable? Um, I think they need, I think they need probably $20 silver at least, and they need, 
and that assumes that they can get what a uh, lucky Friday back in Idaho because it's there's it seems that there's some big big problems between the management team in Hecla and the mining union there in Idaho and then also uh, I think they need like they need a lot higher gold price what one of my friends Peter Spina of gold seek thinks they'll do is they're gonna restructure their debt and they're going to dilute and they're going to do a combination of these things issue more debt restructure it and then do a combination of dilution and then share and then maybe a reverse stock split a combination of those things and they might be able to avoid bankruptcy and survive i don't know they have a lot of challenges hecla has major major operational issues that they have to fix that are not that are not cheap they're very expensive capital consuming and then on top of that they have a lot of debt so they the cap the cash flow that's coming in they have to use to fix their debt problem and then they also have capex problems on their producing mines which are not generating free cash flow. But this the last time I looked extensively at Hecla was I think like two months ago. I haven't looked at them recently. They did announce that their costs were coming down a little bit, but it's a dangerous game. I wouldn't I personally would not bet on it. That's just me. So to summarize everything, there is a transition of people. People are transitioning from the safer, higher quality gold companies. They're transitioning to the riskier stuff now. Now, if gold prices do not stay high, if they do not either stay at these levels or go higher, that risk transition from the safer, higher quality gold companies that have gone up a lot for years, for, the, for at least the last year or two, that have outperformed all the other gold companies, that transition to the riskier gold companies may stop. But there are a lot of producing miners and a lot of juniors that need to raise capital. Some of these, there's been smaller capital raises of a few million, maybe even 10, 20, 30, 50 million, but there has not been a $100 million or more capital raise yet to my knowledge. And if the gold price in dollars keeps rising, there will be. And this is why also if you're a long-term investor or at least you're planning on buying for a year, two, or three for some of these gold mining companies, this is why you don't buy all of your position at once. Because if you buy all your shares at once and then all of a sudden there's a dilution, stock dilution that occurs that you weren't aware of, you're down 20%, you didn't know about the dilution, and then you have to wait to break even. Trifecta asks, what are the best mining stocks you recommend that are legit? I'm not recommending anything. I'm just giving my opinion. I talked about Pan American Silver back in May. I talked about it at length on my podcast here. You can go back in the archives. It's on the record. When Pan American Silver was at $10 per share and it got up as high as 16 So in about three months, it went from $10 per share up to 17 It's having a little correction now, but I think it's a very solid company. I think the bankruptcy risk is low. And you guys know about Sandstorm. I put my money where my mouth is, my cost basis on a lot of Sandstorm gold shares. I bought them years ago when there was blood in the streets in 2015 and early 2016. The cost basis on a lot of my Sandstorm gold shares are between 2 and $3 per share. I almost tripled my entire Sandstorm gold position with the blood in the streets. And I don't plan on selling any of it. There's a lot of growth in the pipeline. There's the Fruta del Norte royalty, which is coming online. I it's not a, a big amount of cash flow, but I like it. Um, if gold prices stay above fifteen hundred dollars per ounce, you're gonna the royalty, the sliding scale NSR royalty that Sandstorm Gold has on the Arizona mine from Equinox Gold that will go from three percent to four percent. So it's already going from three percent to four percent, and in and on an 
Yeah, and on an annualized basis, the annual cash flow will go. It doesn't seem like a big increase from three percent to four percent, but on an annualized basis, the cash annual cash flow will go from five million dollars per year up to ten million. So it is significant to the company. The the share buyback program has slowed down for Sandstorm Gold. They're paying down their debt very quickly with the higher gold price. What what a lot of people are not aware of is that Sandstorm Gold's costs are not rising. So they have even bigger margins now. So Sandstorm Gold, I'll, uh, this is a case study here. So when they're, uh, when the gold price was around 1250, I think they were making around 60, 60 million, $65 million in annual revenues, maybe approximately when the gold price was at 1200 or 1250. But now that the gold price is, um, a little above 1500 Sandstorm Gold's annual revenues are closer to $90 million. So they are, they had a big increase now in cash flow and that's going to allow them to pay off the last deal that they did using their revolving credit facility which is temporary debt they pay that off and then they can go back on the hunt looking for the next deal which is why i love the business model so if the gold price does uh, uh corrects the gold price corrects sandstorm gold has cash now they still have cash good cash flow good diversified cash flow more assets coming online soon and they can go look for the next deal and if the gold price goes up, they're going to make even more money. But the market seems, for now at least, to be risk on. Which means that the more marginal producing miners and the juniors are going to do well. Uh, Sandstorm is a good buy on dips. In my opinion, it is a good buy on 10% dips because all their growth pipeline almost all of which is already paid for, or they only have one-time CapEx payments to get basically 10 years or 20 years of cash flow for a one-time CapEx payments of 30 million or the Agua Rica Goldstream, the one-time CapEx payments. All that is not priced into the stock right now. And a lot of their royalties that Sandstorm has in their growth pipeline are already paid for, meaning they don't have to pay big CapEx bills for the royalties to come online with more cash flow. So that's why I think from a risk reward perspective, when there's big corrections in Sandstorm Gold stock, I think it's a uh, continued buy. Again, not financial advice, just my opinion. If I had more, if I was making more money from this podcast, my I would continue to buy more shares of Sandstorm Gold. I'm not making enough money right now to think about buying even more shares. Unfortunately, I am starting to make more money now because thank you guys, I have a 100 Patreon account contributors. So thank you very much for that. But um, not enough yet where I have uh, some money I could set aside for a large amount of savings and start buying more shares. I haven't sold any of my uh, position yet in Sandstorm Gold, and I don't plan on doing so. They have more growth than any other company already in their pipeline, already paid for, or one-time CapEx payments. Hey, BC, thank you. Uh, BC says, thanks for all your work. Just found you last week. Um, okay, I'm glad you just found me, man. The channel's growing really quickly. We, we're growing at almost 2,000 new subscribers per month, and I think we just did almost 300,000 views per month, which is, uh, I haven't done that in a long time since the YouTube censorship increased in uh, 20, 2016, and things just got really bad for me. So I'm glad that more people are finding my work. My channel should have over 100,000 subscribers. Um, if you're, if you want to listen to interviews I've done with experts, there's hundreds and hundreds of interviews with some of the best experts in energy, in gold, in value investing and global macro in the archives. Hey, hey Bryce, I'm glad excuse me hey bryce thank you for the kind words my content is absolutely the most raw i'm not sure if i would use raw as a as a popular adjective but you're using it there raw unbiased content thanks for all the hours you spend in pure research well i'm warning you guys because look the gold industry now they're calling me a crypto pumper which is just ridiculous i get emails from people who are experts in gold and they're calling me a crypto pumper which is just ridiculous i most of these experts in gold right i know more about the gold market than they do And that's because I don't repeat myself, and that's because I put in the work. There was many weeks, guys, where I spent over 80 hours per week learning and researching, interviewing people, interviewing other experts, studying other people's opinions, going back through financial history. 
Most of the people in the gold industry never did any of that. A lot of people just basically repeat themselves. So many not safe for work stories I could tell that would get me in trouble from people in the gold industry. Thoughts on Yamana Gold. Yamana is a very marginal producer. Yamana has some good assets. Yamana has Cerro Moro Online, which is a solid gold and silver mine. They have the one up in Canada, a share of that, the mine up in Canada. The problem with Yamana Gold, David, in my opinion, is the debt on the balance sheet. So Yamana Gold will not be able to afford the CapEx bill. They, they're going to owe approximately, unless the feasibility study changes for Agua, Agua Rica, they're going to owe $1.2 billion in CapEx for Agua Rica. They can't afford it. So which means that they're almost definitely going to sell, probably sooner than later. And that will hopefully fix the balance sheet. I would watch the balance sheet for Yamana Gold. There's been rumors for a while the company is up for sale. But in general, Yamana Gold... They, ha they had to sell Chapada. I did not like that, but they felt they had to. Then they increased the dividend. A lot of people did not like that. Yamana Gold was lagging in share price up until recently. Looks like on that chart up until June, Yamana is up. Let me pull up the, the chart. I can read better. Yamana Gold is up. Where is it? 65% since June. So that is very good. However, how many people actually bought Yamana Gold in June and had perfect timing on the stock? Very few people. I know a lot of people that were speculating on Yamana a, a lot longer than that and did not do well. So that's why I said that this graph here with the gains since June, it's misleading. It's recency bias and cherry picking data because a lot of people have held bad gold stocks for a lot longer than that. But props to you if you had perfect timing. If you had Kirkland Lake Gold and you had Franco Nevada and Sandstorm Gold and then you sold out of those after big profits and then in June you transitioned perfectly into the riskier miners and then continued to make 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent or more profits on your riskier mining stocks. I'm doing this warning because I do not want to see people wake up and then all of a sudden they've lost 30 percent of the mining shares, 30 percent on a mining stock they just bet on. That's why I'm doing this. There are ways to protect yourself. There are ways to hedge yourself. I do not want to see anyone lose 30% in a very short or more in a very short amount of time. And if a mining company does a large enough capital raise, it can happen. It can happen in a week. You could be out on vacation thinking that your mining stocks, gold mining stocks are doing well. And then you check the uh, your E-Trade account or whatever on your phone. And then all of a sudden, the mining company decided to do a massive capital raise and you're down 20% or more, like snap of a finger. And there are ways to protect yourself. Most people will not do it, though. Most people don't want to, don't know how to hedge, won't learn how to hedge. Don't care until it's too late. I don't like the GLD ETF period, Cyber. It's a big trading vehicle. A lot of Wall Street money will use GLD as a proxy. I don't like it at all. You don't get any uh, long-term capital gains taxes from buying and holding GLD. You don't lock in the, the lowest tax rate possible, 10%. McEwen Mining is a higher cost producer. They just had a, another mine come back online. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they can fix the problems at Black Fox. I like Rob McEwen. I don't like his gold price predictions. I don't like what he says about the royalty and streaming company industry. It's hypocritical, especially because he's the largest shareholder of a smaller royalty and streaming company that pays himself a large dividend. But I think McEwen Mining, he's running it the right way. He's paying himself, what, a dollar in salary? And his money is where his mouth is. The problem with McEwen Mining is that they have higher cost mines. And we'll see if they can lower costs and make more efficient mines. But it seems to be that the balance sheet is okay for now. And I would expect McEwen Mining then to maybe do a capital raise. I don't know how big. A capital raise soon. I don't know how big. Maybe like $60 million. Maybe a smaller one. But according to Nolan Watson, I spoke to him last week. And it sounds like he said the market is available now. For these senior miners, the senior gold miners, and the mid-tier gold miners to go out and raise $100 million if they want to. 
there is the ability to raise that capital, $100 million or more. The problem is if the miners mishandle this, the stocks could be down 20% or more in a very short amount of time. And then the shorts are going to start attacking it, especially if the gold price in dollars starts to correct. What is my prediction for the gold price? Well, it looks like, Mark, it looks like the negative interest rates are going to keep spiraling out of control. We're almost at $17 trillion in negative interest rates already. I talked about this yesterday. So if that continues and the currency war continues with the dollar and the euro and the trade war continues to escalate, I think it's, a, it's worse than just an escalating trade war now between the U.S. and China. I think it's basically a new type of Cold War. So I think all of these things together will all eventually, in the short term, anything can happen. There can be a short-term correction in gold. I think uh, long-term, though, the longer you look out, I think the higher the gold price is in every currency, including U.S. dollars. So I think maybe, educated guess, we could see gold at 1600 or 1650 by the end of this year if things work out for gold. If the gold price drops, the mining companies will have not raised their capital and the mining companies are back in trouble again. The higher cost, the marginal higher cost miners with the bad balance sheets, they really need to raise, a lot of these mining companies really, really need to raise capital, a lot of it, and more than one capital raise. And it, they may have missed their window if the gold price drops and has a correction for the rest of this year. No, I do not always place a stop loss on gold stocks. In fact, I don't own a lot of the regular mining companies anymore because I know I don't trust the management teams. You can make a lot of money in a short amount of time on the mining companies, but you're also taking an enormous amount of risk, in my opinion. I don't buy a lot of regular mining stocks anymore, and it's because I know I've been lied to directly on the phone. I've been lied to in emails. I've been lied to directly to my face from people who run mining companies, investor relations, uh, senior management. You can make money in mining stocks, but like I've tried to reiterate again and again, most people do not understand the, the risks that they're taking on owning an individual mining stock. And what could happen if you don't have hedges or risk mitigation strategies in place and you pick out the wrong mining company. Which is why, in my opinion, there's not financial advice. Most The average retail investor should only either stick with the royalty and streaming companies. And yes, you're not going to outperform when the gold price is going up. The riskier, more marginal stocks are probably going to outperform on a percentage basis. But if the gold price is not going up, you might not lose 30, 40, 50% quickly or more. Or a mining stock ETF. So royalty and streaming companies are a mining stock ETF. There's a number of mining stock ETFs. I'll read them really quick. You have GDX. You have GDXJ. You have Frank Holmes's one, which is GoAUX. Let me look it up. Yeah, GoAU. So Go, G-O, and then the symbol for gold on the periodic table of elements, AU. That's the U.S. Global Go Gold and Precious Metals Mining Index. And then you have the two Sprott ones. You have SGDM and SGDJ, and then you have the Silver Miners ETF, SILJ. The resolution on the graph is intentionally low, Rick. That's all I could fit on the screen. It's an enormous uh, graph. If you want to see the full graph, you go to Ronald Stuffelay's Twitter handle. He has the graph up there. I think Peter Peter Schiff also put it up on his Twitter. And then it's in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. The graph is enormous. It takes up a full page. So it's not going to fit in a thumbnail.
we've been in bad inflation for a while. These negative interest rates, what the central banks are doing is all, all these central banks are in a currency war, race to debase. No one wants a strong currency now. The U.S., uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury want to control devaluation. No one wants a strong currency. Even the emerging markets have that have enormous net capital outflows, they're, I believe, doing QE now too to try to prevent their currencies. The emerging markets are, are trying to do rate cuts and they're trying to do QE, I believe, too. Everyone's trying to do it. But I think there's a lot of flight capital that's leaving emerging markets, leaving China, leaving the European Union, and a lot of it's going into U the U.S. Treasury market. Oh, thank you for joining Patreon. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. Well, I'm at 50 minutes. I'm pretty tired. I think I've covered pretty much all the stuff I wanted to cover. I'm going to go relax now. Everyone have a nice rest of your, rest of your night. And um, we'll see what other content happens this week. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of current events because um, it seems to me there's a lot more negative stories coming out. And it's increasing at an increasing rate. And this reminds me a lot of 2008 and 2009. The timing of the exact stuff of of all when all this exact stuff happens is going to be very tricky but the amount of negative news stories has really spiraled um in the last six to twelve months i think it's increasing okay bye for now